Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Small Biz Better Summit. We are so happy to have you here for another amazing, amazing session. Many of you already know who I'm about to introduce. And for some of you, this is your very first time. And let me tell you, you are in for an amazing, amazing treat. Mr. Sean Smith is back with us again for the Small Biz Better Summit. How are you doing, Sean? I'm amazing, brother. I'm good. Amazing and good is the way to be. Now, I know many of you are already excited because you've known, you've been to the sessions that Sean has done before. And of course, he has an amazing session again for us here today. If you're new to Sean, let me tell you a little bit about him. Absolutely, absolutely amazing transformational coach. Uh, he's my life coach. He's so many others life coach. And he has such, such amazing perspective and just little minor tweaks that you can do to really improve and really just add more enjoyment, love, fulfillment, so many positive energies to your life. So I'm really, really excited what he has to share for us today. If you've attended previous summits, then you may be familiar with his nine irrefutable laws of entrepreneurship. And we did parts one and part two, and we had a bonus session. And now today we're doing part three, the nine irrefutable laws of entrepreneurship, part three of three. And so I know you are excited. We are excited. Some of you may have missed the first two entrepreneurial laws. Well, uh, they're part of the previous summits that we've launched. So if you did miss those, just let us know and we'll be finding a way to probably include those in a future summit or so, so that you might be able to catch those if you miss those. So Sean, man. Oh, and let me also mention Mr. Sean Smith today is taking time out of his very busy schedule because he is on his way to a TEDx talk <laughs> right after he finishes this. And get this, after he flies back home, he's going to be joining us again tomorrow for a live Q&A session right after his TED talk. So amazing, amazing man that's sitting right here in front of us, Sean. We can't thank you enough, man. Yeah. Th thank you for everything. And that last thought. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so the next time I'll be with you. I will be on the other side. I will be officially a TEDx speaker. Uh, I'm excited about that, but I'm, I'm excited now to be here with you guys and, and you specifically and continue this conversation about entrepreneurship, man. This, uh, it's, it's the inner game of entrepreneurship is not just the most important game, but it's almost the entire game. People are searching for the tricks and the rules and the hacks and the shortcuts and the microwave approaches, and they're just getting swallowed up. Mm -hmm. And the world today is so hyper distracted and hyper overwhelmed. And, you know, it's, it's literally like we're dealing with a hurricane of information because we got stuff swirling all around us, right? It's like a tornado all around us. And if you, are caught in a hurricane where you need to go is underground, right? You, you, you need to go deep and the, the winds can be blowing hundreds of miles an hour and they can knock down buildings. But a lot of the trees, especially the ones that can bend and are flexible, the trees will still be standing because the strength is in the roots of the trees. Mm. It's not in the cement of the buildings. And that's a really important analogy for us to understand as entrepreneurs. Yeah. The world is unstable. The world is chaotic. The world is hyper, uh, not just distracted, but moving incredibly quick. And the world is phenomenal. So I don't mean to, to say that all that stuff is negative. We just have to understand that, you know, the, the moving walkway that used to be going like a few miles an hour you know, it's going a lot faster. So you can't just toe dip your way onto it and just ease your way onto it anymore. Like you got to be prepared. This thing is just moving quicker. And we need to take all this stuff into account because we, as the entrepreneur, are the most important factor by far in the success of our business. So this conversation has become so much more important for me over the last year or two. And I'm happy to to, uh, to break down these nine laws that I've just noticed in my own life. So uh, if you want me to jump into those, those first six, we can, or if you have anything else to say, we can go wherever you want. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to 
make sure everyone knows if you're new again to uh, Sean, just give you a little bit of background info on Sean. Sean has been doing transformational mindset work, uh, transformational life coaching for the last 20 years now. He's helped several businesses reach the million dollar mark in their businesses. He himself has reached the million dollar mark several times in his business as well. So I just want the audience to know exactly who you're listening to if you're new to Sean. And if you are not new to Sean, a nice reminder always helps as well. So I hope you all are listening. I hope you have your notepads out ready to take notes or you have your Google Drive out ready to take notes because he is about to drop a lot of gold nuggets. Get your pails ready. Yeah, let's get it. I am a teacher. If you haven't heard me before, I like to dissect things because we can't control that which we don't understand. So when we just try to learn the rules and focus on just the surface level tools, if anything changes, then we're in trouble. You know, nowadays there's obviously a lot of emphasis put online for good reason. But if all you do is just follow the rules of online, but you don't understand marketing, you don't understand messaging, you don't understand yourself, then as soon as the rules of online platforms change or an individual platform changes, you can't recover. So you have to understand yourself and you have to understand the, the essence of being an entrepreneur, not just the tools of building a business or the tools of marketing. And I titled these nine laws as laws really intentionally because what a lot of people are looking for are the rules. And there are certain laws of entrepreneurship that you just simply have to understand, right? You can't, and you can't change it. So what a lot of people are doing is they're trying to change the laws. It's like going outside and not liking gravity. So you're just going to demand that gravity change, right? You're just going to demand that you throw something up and it just keeps going up. It doesn't actually come back down like it does for everybody else. So what a lot of people are doing in the entrepreneurial space is they are demanding through their expectations and their emotional attachments that the laws don't apply to them. And what I'm telling you is that the laws cannot change. The only choice you have is whether you're going to play by the laws or not. And almost everybody, especially early on in the game, they don't play by the laws, number one, because we don't know the laws. The laws of entrepreneurship are entirely different than the laws of employeeship or just the laws of normal life as we're navigating the world. So these nine laws are really critical to understand. And just to get you caught up with a little bit of a recap, if you didn't hear the previous sessions or you just, you know, I, I just want to represent it. The first law is the law of business creation. And I spent a lot of time dissecting creation versus reaction. As a creator, you have to operate differently than as a reactor. And all of business, almost all of business at least, is about creation, especially if you are the business, if you are the speaker, the writer, the coach. You've got to understand what it takes to create. And most people haven't unlocked their creative muscles because they're just stuck in reacting mode. The second law is the law of requisite failure and fear. I, I actually switched them, fear and failure. Uh, it's, it's not a probability that you will experience fear and failure. It's a requirement. And not only is it a requirement in the sense that it's just simply going to happen, but it's a requirement for you in order to grow, in order to move beyond your comfort zone, you have to heal your relationship to fear and failure. The third law is the law of certain uncertainty. I guarantee you, you will feel uncertain. I guarantee you there will be times where there are no guarantees. And yet our unconscious mind really wants guarantees. Our unconscious mind wants control. Our unconscious mind wants to know with certainty that 
if you do this action, you will get that result. And if you demand that that's the case, then you can't play business. It's just that simple. The fourth law is the law of continual investment. There are three things that you invest, time, energy, or money. You have to invest in order to get a return, and it's not an immediate return. Most people that have an employee mindset and they're focused on reaction, they're expecting to put $5 in and get $500 out. They're essentially playing the lottery, but they're expecting every time they scratch the little gray stuff off the card that they win and that they win like a hundred times more. And if they don't have this guaranteed win, then they don't want to make the investment. And again, you just can't play business that way. The fifth law is the law of value exchange, especially when it comes to sales, but marketing, messaging, leadership, building a team, everything is an exchange of value. I have something of value. You have something of value. If I have a product to offer, a program, a coaching opportunity, and you have money, then we can exchange the value. If my product is worth more in your mind than your money, then it'll be easier for you to say absolutely yes to that. So when we focus on sales as a value exchange and we focus on increasing our value rather than learning sales techniques, then sales becomes a lot easier for most entrepreneurs. And finally, number six is the law of sacred integrity. Most people are living the scared life. I want you to live the sacred life life, which is actually the exact same collection of letters with just the A and the C reversed, but they are complete opposite ends of the human spectrum. And when you live a sacred aligned life and you operate your business that way, you will feel different. You'll put out different energy and people that are attracted to you will be attracted to alignment rather than being attracted to desperation. So those are the first six laws that will get you caught up. And now we'll jump into the next three. Mark, is there anything you want to add or ask? No, I just think that's amazing. And what really struck me again was when we talk about the placement of that C, the, the same thing with the first law, reaction versus creation, that C. <laughs> and then now we're talking about sacred versus scared. That same C is appearing again and again. It's just its orientation that really stood out to me. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I, I haven't yet identified what that C is. It could be certainty. It could be uh, or creation is already one of those. Anyway, I don't want to spend the time here trying to figure that out. But, I think but, that will be worthy. <laughs> but I know. Curiosity. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing. I get the feeling that that C is going to reveal itself pretty soon to me, and it's going to be massively profound. And so I don't even want to spend the time. Uh, chasing it. So let's jump into these, these final three laws here. The seventh law of entrepreneurship is the law of progressive disruption. And this phrase has a double meaning here. It, it means that the disruption will continue to progress. The disruption will progressively get bigger as you move forward. And it also means that the disruption is for your progress. So the disruption leads to progress. And the best way to understand this is a, a situation that happens in nature that all of us are aware of. But most of us, if you're like I was a few years ago, you don't really fully understand what's happening here. And this analogy is so profound for our human experience, and it relates to being an entrepreneur so incredibly well. And it's the transition that a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. And it's not actually a transition, it's a transformation. It's a very, very rare occurrence on the planet where two life forms actually share a life cycle. Because the caterpillar and the butterfly are not the same animal. The caterpillar actually is not the earlier version of the butterfly. And the butterfly is not an evolved version 
of the caterpillar. And this is where the profound lessons really lie. So these two animals are completely separate from each other. So the caterpillar doesn't go into the chrysalis, which is where it transforms. The caterpillar doesn't go in there and then just, you know, stretch its arms and build wings and all stuff. Inside the chrysalis, the caterpillar actually completely dies and disintegrates. So all of its parts, all of its scientific parts and enzymes and all these things are left over after it dies and basically dissolves inside the chrysalis. And the caterpillar has to do this because if it doesn't, the caterpillar is going to extinguish itself. The caterpillar just roams around and eats everything that it can. And given enough time, the caterpillar would literally self-extinguish. It would kill itself by just eating itself to death. But it hits a certain point where its body starts to transform inside. And then the caterpillar actually builds its own chrysalis. Now, it doesn't have the forethought that we as humans do. So it doesn't know, okay, I got to build this chrysalis because I'm going to disintegrate. You know, it's all ingrained in its DNA and whatever. But the caterpillar builds its own chrysalis, enters a chrysalis, and then it dies. And then once the, the leftovers, if you will, for the, for the caterpillar start to mesh with each other, I'm, I'm searching for the scientific words and they're escaping me now, but start to, to mesh with each other, then the butterfly starts to actually be formed. So the word transformation means changing of form. So the caterpillar dies and then the pieces shift and then the butterfly is created. And when the butterfly exits the chrysalis, it's a completely different animal and it operates its life in a completely different manner. The purpose of the caterpillar is different than the purpose of the butterfly. And so the caterpillar cannot know what it's going to be like as the butterfly, nor can the butterfly remember what it was like as the caterpillar. And yet in our lives, how many times do we know we need to grow to the next level, but we're trying to figure out what it's going to look like? We're trying to build that ladder from this current phase to the next current phase. And what I'm telling you is you cannot comprehend what's at that phase and you won't remember what's at that phase before anyway. Now, I'm not saying that literally as human beings, we're not going to be able to remember our past. So this isn't a literal transfer in terms of this analogy, but conceptually, it's so critical to understand in the context of how we handle our fears and our desires for certainty, because we want everything to be known. We want to know how we're going to fly before we enter the chrysalis. And what I'm telling you is this just, it, it's impossible. And sometimes I've talked to so many people about this. Sometimes, maybe most of the time, the people that have these massive transformations in their lives, if you ask them what happened before they decided to enter this chrysalis effectively, it's some version of, I just couldn't do this anymore. I just can't continue doing it this way. And that's the whole concept of, when the pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of change, then we will change. And I want to tell you a little story about this that's, that's really dear to my heart because it has to do with my mom. I won't tell you the full, you know, 30 minute version. We just don't have the time for this, but I had a, a really poor relationship with my mom growing up. And it wasn't until I was an adult, I was in my mid thirties, that I understood about myself, why I was projecting all my pain and anger on my mom, but I also understood what she was going through because she told me in a single phone call that changed not only my life, 
It changed my relationship with her. It changed my perspective of her. And it really applies to what we're talking about here. And so my mom grew up, you know, really having a lot of struggles, emotional struggles, massive depression. She had seven miscarriages between my sister and myself, who we are we're 10 years apart. She didn't work. She was in therapy most of her life. Uh, she had a terrible relationship with my father. And I didn't understand any of that stuff growing up. So, you know, I just made a decision, an unconscious decision that she was the bad guy. And I, I wouldn't allow her to love me, essentially. And so I really blocked myself off from her for a long, long time, for about 25 years. And then we had this conversation. And she told me about her childhood. Something that she had never told me, I think because she probably didn't get the sense that I could handle it until I got into this work and I started talking about trauma and limiting beliefs and all the things that uh, we go through as humans in our childhood. And she told me about her abuse as a child. She was molested uh, repeatedly. And then she explained to me about all of her depression and her trying to understand herself and her going to therapy when she was young and all these things. And then she explained to me about how she got married and had my sister and then had all these miscarriages. And then the doctors said, the therapist that couldn't really get her to access any of these memories, the therapist said, we want to do electric shock treatment on you. And, you know, this is the early 60s or mid 60s and electric shock treatment was this like almost barbaric process especially compared to what we know today but essentially they were just going to electrocute her you know at a low level and burn the memories out of her brain that was the the point and they said when we do this we don't know if you're going to remember anything because when we go in, it's almost like, you know, what we know about uh, chemotherapy, right? They go in and they can't just identify the cancer cells and only kill the cancer cells. They kill a lot of the other cells as well. So similar with the brain cells, they told her, we're going to go in and we're going to go after these memories, but we don't know what other memories are going to be snatched away as a result. So they told her, say goodbye to your husband and your daughter, because when you're done, you might not know who they are. And when she told me this, I couldn't fathom that scenario. And I said, mom, how did you say yes to, to that? Like, how do you say yes to, sure, do this procedure for me. And I might not know anything, including who my family is. My little daughter on the back end. Yeah, go ahead. Sign me up. I said, how could you possibly do that? And she just said, the thought of me losing everything was better than me continuing the way it was because I was in so much pain and I was willing to risk. Essentially for her, she was willing to risk dying to herself because she might not remember who she is on the back end. So literally she did have the option of dying to her previous memories and not knowing who she was on the other end, or at least that's what the therapist and the doctors told her. And she said, yes, because if she would have continued, she would have ended up just killing herself because the, the pain was just too much. And when she told me about all the pain that she was dealing with, then I finally got it. I finally understood how a human can be in that amount of pain and then say yes to something like that. Now, thankfully, most of us are not dealing with that scenario where we're literally going to forget who we are, nor are we dealing with the amount of pain and stress and pressure that we want to kill ourselves. But we're experiencing some level of all of those emotions. Just being a human, we experience depression, whether it's super deep and you know, we, we have deep, dangerous, dark thoughts, or we just have a low level depression. We're all experiencing failure. We're experiencing doubt. We're experiencing all these things as humans. 
And the thing that I want that, that I got a few years ago, once I understood this and what I want all of you to get is that when we're in this pressure cooker, it's a sign that we need to go to the next level. And what most of us do is we retreat from the signs that are telling us to go because the signs are uncomfortable. They come inside this pressure. They come inside these doubts. They come inside these scary questions like, who am I and what am I doing? And do I want to continue doing this? So most people actually retreat from the invitations to grow. And that's a massive, massive mistake. Most people that have the employee mind, they equate growing with risk. But entrepreneurs who've learned this game and how to be successful, they equate, equate not growing with risk. They equate not growing with regret. So most entrepreneurs are afraid of taking action and getting rejected. I don't know if I said uh, entrepreneurs or employees, so let me say that again. Most employees and most people are afraid of taking action and experiencing rejection, most successful entrepreneurs are terrified of not taking action and experiencing regret. Now, those two perspectives are completely opposite on the spectrum of human thought. So we have to decide what's our bigger fear. Is our bigger fear rejection or is it regret? If it's rejection, you can't be an entrepreneur because you're going to constantly experience rejection and fear and failure. Like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's required. So if you're more committed to not experiencing failure, you can't play entrepreneur. If you're more committed to not experiencing regret when you look back on your life and go, how did I live and what did I do while I was here? Then you can play entrepreneur because you're thinking from the right place of fear of regret rather than fear of rejection. Because here's what I want you to understand. If you're afraid of rejection and the rejection comes from action, then what that means is your default response is don't act. We all know we can't get anything without action beyond what we currently have. So every one of our goals and dreams requires action. So if our default programming is don't act, then we have to overcome our default programming just to get to neutral. Then we have to motivate ourselves to get into action all based on this fear of rejection and fear of risk. But entrepreneurs that learn how to operate this way successfully and, and get control over their mind and manage their fears and and all the risks that I'm talking about, what they recognize or what they become programmed with is their default response is take action. So entrepreneurs by default want to act. And then we have to pull ourselves away. We have to filter all the opportunities because we want to go after everything. Most employees don't want to go after anything until they know it's guaranteed. Entrepreneurs understand I'm going to throw a hundred pieces of spaghetti up against that wall. 90 plus of them are just going to fall all the way back down and I might lose some money and I might lose some time, but I've, I've not lost anything actually if I've learned. So our default programming is either toward motion or stagnation. If your default programming is toward stagnation, that has to be fixed first in order for you to do this thing called being an entrepreneur. And the idea of the caterpillar and the butterfly, what I want you to really get out of that as it relates to your life is that your current life, your current stage of business is a certain container. You're, we're all living in a certain container. And our current container has a current capacity, which means there's a ceiling on our current container. 
And that current container's capacity is perfect for all the results we've already gotten. All the recipes that we're following are great to produce all the results that we've gotten. But we cannot produce results beyond the current capacity of our container. So if we want new results, that means we need a bigger capacity, which means we need a bigger container. The container being our body, not physical bodies, like we don't need to physically get bigger, but we need to emotionally, energetically expand. We need to be able to contain a bigger set of thoughts and emotions or team members or sales or money. Our container needs to expand in order for the capacity to expand, in order for the results to expand. But most people are demanding that it happen in the opposite direction. Most people are demanding that as soon as I get the results, as soon as my business pays me money, as soon as customers hire me, then I will go through the growth process. It doesn't work that way. You grow first, then you get the results. But the employee mind says, I will grow as long as I can guarantee that I'm going to get the results. So what most people are doing is they're trying to stuff more and more results into the current container. And if you get the results stuffed into the current container, the container is going to need to break. And a lot of times we misunderstand that that's our chrysalis wanting to break so that we can expand. So we can't be afraid of the pressures of entrepreneurship because there will always be some pressure, in my experience at least, there will always be some pressure. The only time when I haven't experienced pressure is when I'm not doing anything. That's when the pressure goes down. Now this doesn't mean that pressure is always intense. It doesn't mean pressure is always dangerous. It just means that if we're moving, there's going to be pressure of some kind. For pretty much all businesses, there's going to be financial pressure at various stages of the game. That's just part of building a business. That's just part of all the different pieces of a business that collide with each other. Then there's going to be emotional pressure. Then there's going to be confidence pressure. You know, I've been doing this work for a long, long time. And I still feel pressure in various places. Sometimes it's live videos that I'm doing. Sometimes it's jumping on stage. I know this, this TEDx talk is, you know, it, it's going to yield a ton of pressure. But after walking off the stage, my capacity will have grown. So we have to understand this idea of progressive disruption because our brains don't like disruption. So if we allow our unconscious mind to react to the disruptions of entrepreneurship, it will tell us to stop growing. It will tell us to stop acting. It will tell us to sit down and put on our seatbelt and stop rocking the boat. And that's just not how building a business is ever going to work. So I went deep on that one because it's such a fundamental mind shift that we need to make. And until we make that mind shift, and it's not just a flip of a switch, nor is it a line that you necessarily cross, and you don't have to wait to sell or to grow your business until you think you've crossed over, but you've got to be working on that relationship to risk while you're still continuing to grow your business. This is a constant back and forth scenario. And some people think that step number one is to heal your mind or your traumas or get the right mindset. And then step number two is to go out and do all the things. And it doesn't work that way. It's going to be constantly coming back in our face. And so one of the things that I deal with a lot of times with our clients is they decide that when they feel that pressure again, when they feel that fear that they've stepped back, that they are starting over again that they shouldn't be feeling this and nobody else is feeling this but me, so therefore I'm a loser. If you have financial pressure in your business, if you have emotional pressure with yourself, if you have friction, if you have doubts, if you have uncertainties and insecurities, 
that means you're in the same place as, and I'm being 100% dead serious right now, you're in the same place as about 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs. Their pressure might not look like yours. Their financial stress might not look like yours. So not everybody's details are the same. But if you're on this game, all of these things will show up from time to time at different levels of intensity and different details, which means you're on the right path. But most people think they shouldn't be experiencing these things. So they judge themselves as being stupid. They judge themselves as doing it wrong. They judge themselves as being the only loser in a whole world of winners. And they create the self-imposed misery that you cannot build a business with. So let's jump into the final two here. The eighth law is the law of three-dimensional support. In order to deal with all these things that I'm talking about, you must have support in three areas. And these Areas are all distinct, but of course, they feed into and off of each other. The first one is yourself. You must have support with yourself, with your identities, with your fears. You need somebody to talk to. You need somebody that understands what you're going through. You need somebody that can see the blind spots that you can't see because the knots that we create are going to be almost impossible for us to untie because we created them with our current set of beliefs and perspectives, we're not gonna be able to untie them unless we expand our vision, unless we expand our perspectives, unless we get outside voices and outside guidance. And a lot of people just for whatever reason are unwilling to give themselves that support. And I think what I've learned, because of what I've learned, I think it's it's a shame because it's the most important area to get support. And I would say for most people, it's the last place they go to for support. Now, I think that's because we don't want to share our crap with everybody, right? We don't want people to see our dirty laundry. We don't want to be real. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to let anybody know that we can't handle things. We don't want to see ourselves in the mirror as needing help or whatever. But all the successful people have that I know have massive support with themselves. And in this world that we now live in, and in this game called entrepreneurship, as a speaker, coach, author, if you are the product, then there's going to be resistance. If you're like most normal humans, there's going to be resistance with visibility, which means we all know we need people to see us. We need people on the website. We need people to watch our videos. We need people to engage with us, but they can only engage with things that are visible and people that are visible. And most people are actually terrified of visibility. So this is the single biggest thing that most people in my experience, in the work that I do, it's the single biggest thing most people need to work on is your confidence in the spotlight, that it's okay for you to be seen. If you are the product, then we need to put the product on the shelf. If the product's not on the shelf, then nobody can engage with the product and nobody can buy the product. But a lot of people are terrified of being on the shelf because they don't like being seen. The reason we don't like being seen is because we think everybody's thinking about us what we're thinking about us. And so if we're constantly berating ourselves, we're constantly apologizing for ourselves, we're constantly not seeing the value that we bring to the table, and then we get in front of 100 people, for most people, the experience is all of that negative head talk just got increased by a factor of 100 because we think all 100 of these people are thinking the same thing. That's why visibility is so scary for most people is because they don't have the control over their own relationship with themselves. That's why they don't want to be seen. And in today's world, not only do you have to be seen, but you have to be vulnerable. You have to be real. You have to be honest. You have to be willing to say, this is who I am without apology. I'm not perfect. In fact, let me share some of my imperfections with you. That's a requirement nowadays for people to care. For people to pay any attention whatsoever, you have to be real. Unless you're one of these 
massive multi-million dollar brands that already has all kinds of followers and they see you on your reality TV shows or your talk show or something like that, that could be slightly different, but that's not the majority of us. That's not almost all of us. We need to be vulnerable in order for us to cut through all of the noise, all of the perfection, all of the sales messages and marketing messages that people are experiencing. We can cut through that with vulnerability. But you've got to be willing to be vulnerable. And that means you got to clear whatever relationship you have with yourself. And I've been doing that work. I didn't know all the things that I'm saying now. But the first thing that I did when I decided to become a speaker back in 2005 is hired a private coach. I didn't realize that I was doing the best thing for myself from the amount of experience that I have now. But now I look back and go, I did the best thing for myself. And there's no wonder why 90 days later, I had a live event with 100 people in the room. And it exploded my business from there. And a few months later, we hit some momentum. And then 18 months after that, in those 18 months uh, of time, we made $300,000 from a new coach, from a new business. And a lot of that is because I did the first thing the, the most important thing first, which is I hired somebody to help me with me. So that's the first thing and the most important thing that you need support around. The second thing is your skill set. You need to know what you're doing. You need to have competence in what you're doing. But the way that you need competence is different than the way a lot of people think you need competence. You don't need academic competence. You don't need perfection competence. But you do need confidence and you do need certainty in whatever it is you're talking about. If you're going to tell somebody that you can help them in their relationship, you better damn well be certain in making that claim. That's a pretty bold claim when we get up and say, I can help you blank, whatever it is, whether it's with marketing or it's with messaging or it's with speaking or it's with your relationship with yourself or any other topic to say, I can help you requires confidence. And that's an energetic magnet that either attracts people or repels people. So it wouldn't be very magnetic if it's repelling people, if they can smell that you don't have confidence in yourself and confidence in your skills, then they're not going to be interested, especially in paying you money. So you've got to find certainty in your ability to work with people and to produce an outcome. And I think a lot of people are trying to sell something that they don't have 100% certainty that they can deliver. And if I'm not certain in my offer, how can you be certain in your purchase? And then the third thing is, how do we do this business building strategically? So you've got to get support in the creation of the business or the scaling of the business, the structure of the business, because there's just a lot of strategies, especially if you've never built a business before. There are a lot of strategies that are unique to business and unique to business where people are the product that most of us don't understand. And we certainly didn't learn this stuff in school. So you've got to be willing to put yourself under the microscope get the confidence and the certainty in your skills and get support from people that can guide you in the building of your business strategically. A lot of us just get too emotional when it comes to the strategies of our business and building a business is scientific to some degree. Building a business is, it, it requires a neutral perspective to a large degree. So when we're attached to our emotions around all of this and we don't feel confident and certain and we're hoping people will pay for our services so that we feel valuable, that's a recipe for misery. That's not a recipe for success. So you need three-dimensional support. The fact that you need support in those three areas doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you stupid. It doesn't mean that you should feel embarrassed. What it means is that you're human and getting support in those three areas is wisdom, not weakness. And it will shorten your learning curve. It will increase your earning curve. It will get you going a lot faster, but foundationally than you could on your own. 
The final law here is the law of embodied confidence. And I've already talked about confidence and energetic uh, transfer. You know, people can feel the energy. And this concept of embodiment is so, so critical to understand. Here's my favorite quote when it comes to embodiment. Knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the cells of your body. Knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the cells of your body, not when it lives in the vault of your intellect. We think knowledge or we think of knowledge intellectually. If I don't have knowledge, then I'm just going to go gain knowledge. I'm going to go learn something, which is fine. We all need to learn. So knowledge is not something that is irrelevant or unimportant, but it's not the whole game, especially in the context of everything that I was talking about, because you will not outknowledge your fear of visibility. You will not outknowledge your fear of speaking. You will not outknowledge your fear of vulnerability. You're not going to outknowledge or out intellect any of your embodied fears. That's the distinction that I want you to really truly understand is that there's intellectual knowledge and then there's embodied knowledge. And when we chase intellectual knowledge, essentially we're collecting information. We're reading books, we're listening to podcasts, we're watching videos, we're understanding things. So we get it, but we don't got it. That's dangerous. When you get it, but don't got it, that's dangerous because you think you're ready. You think you're prepared. So a lot of people think they're ready for something and intellectually they're... 100% prepared, but then they experience the thing that they had prepared themselves to avoid. Like they experience failure, they experience a piece of feedback, or they experience rejection or something. They had already acknowledged their way to avoid experiencing that, but then they do, and then they melt down because their body wasn't prepared. So many of us are intellectually prepared for something that we are embodied that we are not embodied yet. In other words, we're prepared intellectually, but we're scared neurologically. We're scared emotionally. And what we really have to understand, which is why that, that the quote of living in the cells of your body is so critical. In times of stress, we will not rise to the level of our intellectual knowledge. We think we will, but we won't. When we get into stressful situations, could be tension in a conversation. It could be you get on stage and the lights are way brighter than you thought they were. It could be that you do a webinar and your microphone isn't working or something is happening in your computer that you weren't prepared for. It could be anything that you weren't expecting that increases your level of stress. And it could be a low intensity or a high intensity, but it's still stress. And what we have to understand is when we experience stress and conflict, the first thing that leaves us is our intellectual knowledge. It's the first thing that goes. Because in times of conflict and stress, our body starts to shift into survival mode. Even if we're not literally in danger of being killed, stress and conflict cause us to shift into survival mode. And intellectual knowledge isn't going to save us when we're in survival mode. So our not like most people are packing the suitcase of knowledge and carrying that around. And guess what? That's the first thing that's getting thrown off the ship. Once the waters get a little bumpy, The first thing that goes is what almost everybody is putting almost all of their attention on and all of their trust in. When we experience stress, we don't rise to the level of our knowledge. We drop to the level of our embodied training. What this body has been through is what we land on, that's the foundation. And if this body has never been through this particular experience and the knowledge has left, 
That's called panic. And that's what a lot of people have experienced or they're afraid of experiencing. And the reason is because the knowledge isn't embodied. So the confidence that I'm talking about needs to be embodied confidence, embodied competence, and embodied certainty. Those are the things that will attract buyers. Those are the things that will attract attention. Those are the things that will attract clients, loyalty, people sharing your work. It's this embodied confidence, competence, and certainty that people are actually searching for, even though they don't know they're searching for it, and they might not be aware of it when they see it or when they don't see it. That's what we're searching for because that calms people's anxieties. People are already searching for help because there's some level of anxiety. They want support. They don't like where they are. They want something different. The worst thing you can do as a leader is increase their anxiety with your anxiety. We've got to calm their anxieties, calm their doubts, calm their fears energetically with our certainty. And it's what I said earlier. I got this. It's not about I get this. It's I got this. And if I got this, I got you. But if you don't believe that I got you, you're not going to follow me. You're not going to pay me. You're not going to trust me. So what we're really after here is trust and following, people actually following you, not just being entertained and not just being intellectually satisfied, but, act, but following based on trust. And that can only come with embodiment. So if we think of the intellectual knowledge as the mind and the embodied competence and confidence and certainty as the body, now we've got a mind-body disconnect. I know we talk a lot about the mind and body connection, and they are connected in many, many ways. In this context that I'm talking about, there's a disconnect. And if you are intellectually prepared, but your body is unprepared, your body always wins. That's one of the reasons why our bodies create the fears that we have that make no sense to us. Like, I've been studying how to speak for years. Why do I get nervous? Well, because your body has a fear that your intellect hasn't solved. That's why. That's why the body will literally sometimes take your breath away. You can't breathe. Or it'll give you cotton mouth. It's trying to get you off this stage because this is dangerous. And the body has access to functions that it can shut down. It has access to sweat glands that it can turn on. It has access to the mind that it can speed up. It's trying to calm itself down and remove the threat, even though the intellect is 100% prepared. So the body always wins. Intellectual confidence cannot overpower embodied fear. Intellectual confidence cannot overpower embodied fear. But embodied confidence can absolutely overpower intellectual fear. Whatever's embodied will outweigh and overcome and overpower whatever is understood, whatever is intellectually captured. So most people are trying to just prepare themselves intellectually. They're trying to understand the process intellectually. They're trying to sell intellectually. They're just putting so much time and energy and focus and trust in the intellect instead of the embodied certainty. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you with here is how do you create that? So a lot of people go, okay, great. I get it. How do I do that? Three things. And your intellect's not going to like this answer, by the way. Because it's, it's not interested in these things. But I'm telling you, this is the only way to create embodied confidence. Ignorant action, failure, strategic adjustments. Ignorant action, failure, strategic adjustments. So many people don't take action because they don't know the right thing to do. Great. Take action. The only way to find the right thing to do is through action. You... 
You assess whether something was the quote unquote right thing to do after you do it. And then you see it, especially as an entrepreneur, especially in business. You don't know what products people are going to buy. You don't know what videos people are going to love. You don't know anything that's going to happen in the future. So you have to take action that's ignorant. You don't know what's going to happen, but you take action anyway. And then almost without fail, you will fail. Meaning almost all the time, what you hope will happen won't happen. You do a video and you hope 100 people comment on it. 100 people aren't commenting on it. You sell a product and you hope 50 people are going to buy it. 50 people ain't buying it. Every once in a while, we actually overperform, but that's very rare. Almost all the time, we underperform. If we want 50 sales, we'll probably get eight, six, 14. That's life. That's entrepreneurship. Your expectations will almost never be fulfilled. But here's the thing that I need you to understand. It's supposed to happen that way. See, most of us think if I have an expectation, if I want 50 people to, to buy something and I only get 12, 50 was the supposed to number, which means 12 is the wrong number. Mm -mm. 12 is the supposed to number. You know how I know? Because that's what came in. 12 is the supposed to number. And for you to bridge the gap between 12 and 50, you have to learn a lesson. There's something that needs to be added to the recipe. And there needs to be a lesson learned that only 12 can teach you. So if you would have accidentally sold 50, you wouldn't have learned the lesson that you needed to learn. So failure not only is common and it's just part of the process, it's a requirement. I want you to start seeking failure like you're searching for presents on Christmas morning. You know there are presents somewhere and you want to find them so that you can open them so that you can do what? Get the gift inside. Every act of failure brings with it a gift inside. But if you're afraid of failure, you're essentially telling everybody, I don't want any presents this year. And then next year, you'll be in the exact same place because you're not learning the lessons that are required to make the growth. So we have to heal our relationship to failure and we have to heal our desire for failure. We have to change to where we actually start wanting failure, not because of the experience of failure. I've been teaching this for a long time. I've experienced this for a long time. We've generated well over $6 million of sales. Like I've been in this game for a long, long time. I don't enjoy failure. I still, after thousands and thousands and thousands of experiences of failure, I don't enjoy it. But I recognize its value. And if you can recognize the value in something that can help you get where you want to go, then you can just swallow the bitter pill. I know I'm not going to like this cough medicine, but I know it's what I need right now. I know I'm not going to enjoy this experience of failure, but I know that if I don't seek it out and I don't do the things that will produce the failure, then I'll never get where I'm trying to go. That's the shift that we have to make. And the third piece I said was strategic adjustments. Once you fail, you see what it created, and then you strategically adjust. But you can't strategically adjust if you're an emotional wreck. If you're an emotional mess because of the failure, you cannot be strategic with your adjustments. All you can be is therapeutic in your avoidance of the feeling of failure. And while we are avoiding the experience of failure, we cannot learn. At least we can't learn growth lessons. We can learn fear lessons and we can tell ourselves, well, I don't ever want to do that again because that sucked. Sure. We can learn protection lessons. We can learn retreat lessons, but we can't learn growth lessons unless we take a look at what happened strategically. In order, in order to do that, we have to heal our emotional attachment to all the things 
that I've been talking about. Action produces failure, produces strategic adjustments, produces more action. It's the cycle. The faster you can get that cycle going, the faster the results you're going to create. You know what most people are doing? Ah, they're trying to stop all of it because the employee mind, the scared mind, the reactive mind says failure is not enjoyable. I don't want to fail. Nobody has ever achieved anything valuable in their life through the avoidance of failure. Nobody. Everybody that's achieved anything significant on this planet, especially in business, has only achieved it through the acceleration of failure. Not the avoidance of it. So what most people are trying to do is they're trying to learn how to swim without touching the water. Good luck. We're trying to avoid messing up when messing up is not just part of the process. It is a required essential ingredient of our growth. And this is the last thought I'm going to leave you on. The reason we don't like failure is because we don't like the discomfort it brings. So we board up all of the opportunities for us, for us to feel uncomfortable. We protect ourselves against all the potential discomfort. But nobody ever grew comfortably. There is no such thing as comfortable growth. Growing pains are required. So you have to ask yourself this critical question. And this question is something that you might have to remind yourself on a daily basis, maybe multiple times every day. The question is, are you more committed to growth or are you more committed to comfort? If you are more committed to comfort, there's nothing wrong with that. But please don't try to build a business. You cannot play the entrepreneurial game committed to comfort. If you're more committed to growth, then don't play the employee game. Don't follow the path of the scared minds reacting and trying to be afraid of failure because that's not your path. So your commitment to and conviction in that commitment to either growth or comfort will determine whether you make it or not. That's what I got for you. Man. That was amazing. People, didn't I tell you were in for a treat? 20 years of pain, man. 20 years of pain. 20 years of struggle. 20 years of lessons. 20 years of success. 20 years of failure. That's what it is. Oh, that was awesome, man. I My only regret is that I wasn't able to take notes during this because that was so many, so many amazing nuggets dropped, so many mindset shifts that you introduced, so many new perspectives and perfect explanations of some why we do a lot of the things that we do. And I know for me personally, why I've done a lot of the things that I've done when I come up against a new opportunity or something that scares me, that makes so much sense. Embodied confidence versus intellectual, uh, the intellectual confidence that all of that just made so much sense, so much sense. And this was just extremely powerful, extremely powerful. Um, if you are new to Sean, we know you're blown away. And even if you're not new to Sean, you're still probably blown away like I am. I've been uh, a student and, and client of Sean's now for five years, and I am still blown away every single interaction we have. It, I, it just when I think like, yeah, you know, there's no way he still has good stuff to offer or new good stuff still to offer. It's impossible. Each time I am shocked, each time I am amazed. This is just simply, simply amazing, man. This is just gold nugget city. Well, I gold nugget that. planet. I appreciate being here, man. And and uh, and you're the truth. So I enjoy having conversations and, and contributions with you and and experiencing your contributions as well. 
Oh, thank you, man. This is this. Uh, and and just a, a personal uh, personal note. I remember. Um, so Sean was one of the ones who helped me through his coaching, helped me realize a lot of the things that were going on in my business weren't necessarily about the business. They were about me as the business owner. It was about things that I was doing. Come, you know, <laughs> it was amazing. It, it, just amazing mindset shifts that you never would think about from the intellect. We're not taught that in school. We're not taught that. Um, even uh, in business, we're not taught that. It, it takes a coach like Sean. It takes someone uh, combined with that three-dimensional support that you mentioned, which I love. It takes help. You know, you're it, it really you can try and do it on your own, or you can get the help. You will do it on your own. It just takes a lot longer. It's a lot more painful. The first person in human history that ever figured <laughs> out on their own. I don't suggest that path. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. Man, this was just absolutely phenomenal, man. I'm I'm uh, this is a shock. I'm at a loss of words. It was that good. And those of you who know me, no, I'm never at a loss of words. But <laughs> now I am at a loss of words. Any final thoughts that you want to leave the the audience with, want to leave the group with? Um we're really focusing on uh, 2020 vision and those three those last three laws really hone in on uh, new levels in our lives and business, which is this month's theme. And uh, any addition? Oh, actually, before you give your final thought, uh, can you just real quickly run through what those seven laws? Uh, sorry, those nine laws are again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the first. Let me grab the uh, the notes back out. The first law is the law of business creation. The difference between creation and reaction. Law number two is the law of requisite fear and failure. It's required to grow. Law number three is the law of certain uncertainty. That's really the only guarantee you have is that there's a lot of uncertainty. Law number four is the law of continual investment, time, energy, and money constantly. The law of value exchange is law number five. In sales, it's really about exchanging value and seeing the value in yourself to share it. The sixth law is the law of sacred integrity, all about alignment that is connected to your purpose and your mission on the planet. Law number seven is the law of progressive disruption. The disruptions will continue to be progressive and the disruptions are for your progression. Law number eight is the law of three-dimensional support. You need support with yourself, you need support with your skills, and you need support with your strategies in your business. And finally, law number, number nine is the law of embodied confidence. Whatever is in your body will overpower whatever is in your mind. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. I hope you all are taking notes. I know that I will be rewatching this to take notes. Even if you are taking notes, it also helps to rewatch this and take notes. Rewatch part one, rewatch part two, and rewatch this again, part three. Because uh, this is absolutely amazing, and uh, yeah, before we get to the uh, the next part, Sean, any final words you want to leave the audience with? Well, first of all, what I want to share is this is the first time I've taught these laws on on your three summits, and it, just in teaching them here, you know, they're much more in my awareness, and so I'm talking about them and other conversations as well, or at least thinking about how they're applying in other conversations. And so uh, these will be in a book sometime very soon because it's, it's only everything. Like you said, the business is about the business owner, right? W one of the things that this will be my final thought to answer your question. What most people are focused on is modifying and managing behavior. What we need to spend more time on is understanding the behavior, meaning who is doing the behaving, not what are the laws to end smoking addiction or, or, or the rules rather. What are the rules to get rid of the fear of failure? What are the rules to get over the fear of visibility? That is feeble to try to understand the universal principles and apply them to individual people. I'll give you a real quick example uh, that just 
popped up in my head. A lot of the work that I've done with entrepreneurs is the fear of making phone calls. I mean, you know, especially back in the days before the internet, people are afraid of picking up the phone. And I used to teach how to get over the fear of making phone calls a certain way, assuming before I understood what I just shared, that everybody's fear can be removed the same way. And then in talking with this one particular woman, she said, no, you don't understand. Uh, one of my ex-husbands like he tried to kill me with the phone. So he had wrapped the phone cord around her throat. So to that person, the fear of the phone is different than to the person who just doesn't want to interrupt people during dinner time, right? And that's a, you know, an extreme example. But the point is, the person in the middle of the behavior is the most important ingredient. The person in the middle of the business is the most important ingredient. And I would say at minimum 90%. And yet what almost everybody is focused on is how do I manage the behavior? How do I change my actions? If all we needed was to know what actions to take, there would be no need for coaches. There, they, because as soon as people knew what to do, they would just do it. The challenge is when we don't do the things that we know we need to do, but we don't know why we're not doing them. That's a human issue. That's a behavior issue, not a behavior issue. And if you understand that if you are the biggest problem, that only makes you normal and human. It means you're on the right path. It doesn't mean you're stupid. I am by far the biggest problem in every area of my life. I've been coaching for years and years and years. And I can't see my own blind spots. I can't coach myself. Even if I identify what's going on, I can't fix it because I'm human. And you can be the world's greatest dentist. You cannot perform your own root canal. You need to sit in somebody else's chair. Regardless of how amazing you are, you can't do that function. And regardless of how intelligent we are, regardless of how much value we have, regardless of how much time we've been trying to do these things, we cannot provide that, we cannot produce that function for us, or we cannot perform rather that function for us that most of us are demanding that we do. And we can't produce the results that we want to produce without spending time, energy, and attention on the single greatest important ingredient. And I would say, most people operate with the exact opposite percentages. They spend at least 90% of their time focused on skill set, law, uh, uh, rules, scripts, how to do all these things. They focus very little attention on the human in the middle of it. Information will never liberate you. Only action will. And that requires us to put ourselves in the middle of the microscope, heal whatever needs to be healed in the behavior, understand whatever needs to be understood in the behavior, remove whatever conflicts are in the behavior. And when that happens, now we can actually implement all the things that we haven't been implementing up until now. That's the critical distinction between success and failure. Man, nuggets being dropped to the very end. Sean, bro, I cannot thank you enough for the nuggets you have dropped today. This is absolutely phenomenal, absolutely fantastic. Um, this whole series actually has been amazing and fantastic. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been amazing. If you have questions, uh, any, if you have questions, make sure to leave them right below this video. Um, Sean will be joining us again after the after his TEDx talk. So now he's getting ready to head to TEDx, drop some more knowledge. We'll see and what again, my body has once I hit that stage, right? <laughs> gotta love his modesty. Right? For delivering a TEDx talk. Well, I don't know. We'll see. 
<laughs> I'm I'm pretty confident you have uh, more than the body. You have the embodied yeah confidence to rock that TEDx. And we just thank you so much for sharing uh, before you head out to that TEDx. We know that's a lot of a big commitment. And you still he still came here to serve and give knowledge. So we can't thank you enough. And right after that TEDx, he's coming back again tomorrow as soon as he lands. Yeah, to do a live Q and A, so make sure you bring your questions. Make sure you attend the live Q and A. Um, we're just really looking forward to looking forward to that live Q and A. Looking forward to getting your questions, your feedback on things that were really impactful for you. That helps, as you as he mentioned. I'm shocked that this is your first time uh, delivering this content because it was so so profound, so amazing. But give us feedback in addition to your questions. If you have feedback, things that resonated with you uh, through all three of the series, let us know so that we can share that information. And let us know so that we can continue to improve on the content and um, uh, answer any questions that you have. So leave your questions. Come back for the live Q&A. Let me speak to that for a sec. Oh, go ahead. The reason that this content can be delivered from a place of certainty is because it's not none of it is theory. None of it is. It was just captured. So it's it's just real. Like I said, it's based on 20 years of real experiences. And when we talk about our experiences, it's so much easier to just put words to them rather than when we try to create intellectual content that we don't have experience of, that's when we get really shaky. So I appreciate your comment and you know the way my mind works like, huh, that's cool. Why did that happen? That's why. It's because I was just sharing what I've experienced. I wasn't delivering any intellectual theoretical content. That's a good distinction, too, man. I really um, that really hits home uh, as we especially as we talk about the embodied embodied confidence and embodied knowledge. That's something that uh, I actually was introduced to by you. And I think uh, last year, maybe about a year or so, that's something that's always been in the back of my mind. This uh, And I use it in some of my talks when talking about uh, if you're driving and you're driving, you mean to, you mean to be going one place and you start driving the way you always drive or you start driving to work by accident because the. Decisions live in your body more than they live in your mind. What'd you say? The body wins. Yeah, the body wins. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just so much amazing content. And everyone, I want you to know, we've already, we didn't even have to twist his arm. We've asked John to do some more summits that are coming up later this year. He was all over it. So you'll be seeing Sean again. Uh, you'll be seeing Sean again in addition to the live Q&A tomorrow, but you'll be seeing him again on more uh, more summits. Uh, more great content for him. Make sure you follow him. Make sure you uh, join his social uh, social media. He gives great content all the all the time, several times a week. So make sure that you have um, have him uh, in your people who you follow. Sean, how can everyone follow you on social media? I am Coach Sean Smith everywhere. C o a c h s e a n s m i t h. So that's my website. That's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere. Awesome sauce. Coach Sean Smith. Sean is spelled S-E-A-N. S-E-A-N. Coach Sean Smith everywhere. So please make sure you follow him. And with that, everyone, we'll conclude part three of the nine entrepreneurial law, the nine irrefutable laws of entrepreneurship. And wow, I am still blown away, still on cloud nine. Can't wait to rewatch this to take some notes. Uh, up next, we have the next session coming up for you. The, the access information for that is already in your email. So make sure you access that on how to access the next session. And remember, attend the live Q&A and also leave your questions that you have from the section. Leave them below here so that we can bring them on the live Q&A as well. So small business better. We look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Sean. Thank you, guys. Take care.